Welcome back to Grade 7 History, Unit Number 1, New France and British North America, 1713 to 1800. This is Lesson Number 8, How Did the Seven Years' War Impact First Nations? Before we begin today's lesson, let's consider the following. After winning the Seven Years' War, why did the British need to be concerned about First Nations issues? I want you to put the video on pause, so that you can take a minute or two to write down your response to this question. And then, when you're ready, you can hit the play button and we'll proceed. All right, let's get started. Now that the British had finally taken New France, they had to consider what to do about the Canadiens and the First Nations peoples. The end of the Seven Years' War led to a series of short-term and long-term consequences for the First Nations after 1763. Trade between the First Nations and the French came to an end after the war. The British limited First Nations access to European goods, and they stopped paying established prices for First Nations goods. This was because British General Geoffrey Amherst, as seen in this painting here, who represented the British Crown, did not see the need to continue seeking goodwill relationships with the native peoples. He saw the exchange of gifts as a form of useless bribery. Chief Pontiac was the leader of the Ottawa Nation. In 1762, he met with other native chiefs, and they discussed a plan to attack the British. A year later, the Seneca Nation started sending secret war messages in the form of wampum war belts to neighboring First Nations. And for those of you who don't know, wampum are beads made of shells, which were used as currency or money among some First Nations, and the patterns on the belt carry hidden messages. Pontiac held another council meeting, and the First Nations represented at the meeting agreed to continue fighting the British. And now I'll just draw your attention to this illustration on the left. If you need, put the video on pause once I'm done speaking. Take a look at this color engraving, which depicts the war council held by Pontiac. How do you think Pontiac's body language influenced the other native chiefs. Take a moment to think about that because we'll talk about this in tomorrow's class. Unfortunately for Pontiac, the British learned of the plan. Fort Detroit was well defended and ready for battle. This did not stop Pontiac, however. His alliance surrounded Fort Detroit and laid siege for five months. Several other forts were seized by Pontiac's allies. Hundreds of settlers were killed or left homeless before peace was finally negotiated. According to some historians, the British fought back with a cruel tactic. At what is now Pittsburgh, British soldiers cut an old blanket into pieces and put the pieces in a metal box. The soldiers told the First Nations warriors that the box contained special powers, and the First Nations peoples could have these special powers if the warriors went home. That way, the soldiers said, the warriors could share the powers with the rest of the First Nations peoples. The warriors did this. When they returned home, they opened the box and gave pieces of the blanket to their peoples. The First Nations peoples did not get powers. Instead, they became deathly ill, and many died. The First Nations peoples did not know that the blanket had been infected with smallpox. Historians cannot agree on whether this actually happened. While many historians believe that British soldiers accidentally spread smallpox during the fighting, other historians claim that the blanket was deliberately infected with smallpox. 
If this is true, then it will be one of the first examples of germ warfare being used to defeat an enemy. Although Pontiac had been successful in convincing many allies to join him, the French refused to join the resistance. They had already suffered too many losses to the British and had agreed to the terms of their surrender. As the violence escalated, a number of Pontiac's allies abandoned him. Even though they defeated Pontiac's resistance, the British realized that they needed to find a way to make peace with the First Nations. Amherst was called back to Britain and was replaced by James Murray, seen in this painting. The British delivered a royal proclamation in 1763 outlining new rules for all of the people living in North America. This proclamation, or official statement, announced that the British were taking over the government of New France, which was renamed Quebec. The proclamation reserved land for the First Nations and promised hunting and fishing rights for the native peoples. The Royal Proclamation also called for all land deals to be made in public and made official with a treaty. Over the next 50 years, the British and First Nations would sign a number of these treaties which were accompanied by gift-giving ceremonies that encouraged native chiefs to support peaceful relations with the British. In, 17, sorry, in July 1764, more than 24 First Nations and members of the British monarchy met to sign the Treaty of Niagara. Under the terms of this treaty, the British promised to keep all settlers out of the Ohio Valley. The promises were symbolized and preserved in a wampum belt. The principles of the Royal Proclamation and the Treaty of Niagara are considered to be among Canada's first constitutional guarantees of Native rights and are still referred to during negotiations between the First Nations and the Government of Canada today. And you can see in this diagram what a wampum belt looks like. So we're at the end of our video, but before we wrap things up, let's discuss the following in class the next day. So here are the two questions which we'll be talking about. Number one, how did Chief Pontiac's actions affect future relations between Europeans and the First Nations? How do you think Pontiac's plan to attack and take down the British would affect the relationship between future generations of both European settlers and First Nations peoples. And number two, why is the 1764 Treaty of Niagara still significant for Canada today? So what you're going to do is put the video on pause so that you can take a few minutes at least to write down your responses to both of these questions. If you don't feel confident in writing your responses to these questions, it means you need to go back and watch this video at least two more times. And then when you're ready, put the video on pause so that you can work on these follow-up questions. So put the video on pause right now. And I look forward to hearing everybody's responses in tomorrow's class. But until then, this concludes today's video.